Cool. So as Jane mentioned, uh, my name is Dan Ryland and I run a digital agency in Stratford or kind of like central London. And I'm going to start out with this uh, kind of statement. So UX is no longer a nice to have. Now to back that statement up, I will uh, drop in some slides. So the aim of this really is to inspire you and, and hopefully challenge a little. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ping me a, a tweet if that's something you prefer, or you can kind of keep it to the end. And uh, yeah, so to set the scene, I will just provide some stats for us here. So uh, every dollar invested in UX results in a return between $2 and $100. Then the next one here is 70% of online businesses fail due to bad usability. So we've got some bad usability on this, <laughs> on this screen. My website doesn't drop the G, it includes the G. So, um, but yeah, and hopefully this presentation won't fail either. So uh, I'm also going to frame it around a, a story of collaboration. Uh, and this story is basically about the collaboration of 28B and Ryland Consulting. So you know that James comes from 28B and the pharma world. And I, or my agency, doesn't necessarily come from the pharma world, but it actually brought a really nice collaboration of kind of expertise in a UX sphere and expertise in the pharma sphere. And I think from that, we were able to kind of challenge one another and bring some new ideas to the table as well. So um, yeah, where did we start with this project or this case study? So basically we started with loving reps, which were our users, and they had really two questions. So where should I spend my time now? And also, what do I need to know before this meeting or, or meetings, as it were? So that's kind of our, our basis for this case study that I'll be sharing about. And the kind of the outworking of this case study uh, or this case or this project were some Viva Insights uh, dashboards that we designed here. So these are just some snapshots of some of the Envision mockups or like prototypes, because I, I don't necessarily want to show real data, otherwise I'll get in trouble. But um, here we have the top left, and uh, it's kind of like a map of a location where you'd be able to see your doctors or, or kind of the people that you need to interact with. A user was then able to uh, select these to put it into your focus list or your today list. And then from there, you would be able to drill down to see this like middle slide, which gives you a load of contextual information about that, that user. Uh, things like next plan engagement. There's also uh, an additional couple of menu items to really gear them up and give them the confidence of that meetup as well. The, the top right here is just a timeline view of all the interactions that that uh, rep had with that particular customer as well. Cool. So, just that's the kind of framework that I'm going to kind of show you some principles. So if we bear it in mind that this case study was, yeah, the map, the, the kind of the contextual view, and uh, I'll share with you five principles that I think are quite important within good UX. So the first principle is good UX is motivational. So for some reason I like doing fist pumps, but I wasn't going to do star jumps either, but yeah, it's that kind of motivational. So what's motivational looking like with our case study? So for us, if we take a little bit of a deeper look here, We've got the map view again, and what we were wanting to do is just basically translate data into a meaningful kind of bit of information. So we're using a map uh, and presenting it in a visual way. So that is a little bit more motivational than, uh, than a table, let's say. The next kind of breakdown to that is navigational items, uh, which are kind of motivating them to act. So we have alerts uh, that we were kind of pulling out of this data to give some visual focus for reps to use as well. And then thirdly, we pretty much allowed the rep to steer their own experience. And um, we wanted to give them kind of the very relevant information. So there's phone numbers and email addresses straight away as the first action. So again, a lot of people think, OK, we've used these like red notifications, but we're still allowing you to pick and choose your focus list or your today list as well here, which is the kind of the motivational aspect of it. So the next uh, principle that I'd like to share is good UX reduces stress. So I was going to use the word simplify, but I kind of like using this frame because it's something that we don't usually talk about in UX um, is about reducing stress if we can. And now if we go back to the case study, what was that looking like for us in our case study? So what we did with the map, we had hundreds of data points on the map which if we showed all of them at the same time would probably induce some stress. So we consolidated many of the data points um, into kind of these clusters that then went on Zoom kind of, um, yeah, the Zoom would detail into those clusters to then break out the clusters if they were grouped together. 
So the kind of outworking of trying to de-stress people is not have a ton of navigation points, but to, to cluster in, to make it more manageable. The second point is organizing information uh, to empower and inform conversations. So once you've had your subset of a list of users that you want to kind of go out and speak to, we were then able to bring in a wealth of contextual information. Now, here this is all dummy text, but we were able to, to give uh, as much as we had on that particular customer. And then finally, we pretty much tried to go to the quickest, simplest like decision-making route uh, by reducing available options. So what did that look like in our example was a, a map view that was based on your location that you could zoom in and, and be quite playful with it. We then allowed them to add those customers into their lists, uh, being kind of empowering their ability to choose, pick and choose. And then finally, the kind of, okay, now I'm happy with these people that I'm going to speak to. What do I need to know as the extra conditional, sorry, contextual information as well. So always easing them in to more information. So my next uh, principle is good UX is consistent. And what does that look like in our case study? Go for it. Sorry, just one question. At what point did you actually involve the sales team inside that? Yep, I'll get to that as well. Thanks, so. Um, so the next kind of one is good design is, is consistent. So we have visual consistency basically by creating a, a small like design system of the assets that we were putting in. And that enabled us to whatever image or whatever list, we had some consistencies. The next point here is just taking patterns, uh, familiar patterns to increase usability. So again, you might have seen that the visual representation of this map kind of follows a Google Maps, you're picking out uh, locations. And then secondly, when we talk about the timeline, we're going across this kind of consistent pattern of a timeline. So we're trying not to reinvent the wheel. So it's then more familiar from a starting point as well. And then finally, just a, a hint, we didn't actually use Storybook. But Storybook is a really, um, really powerful tool when it comes to building front end UI components. So when you start coding it, you might want your developers to use something like Storybook, which gives you a, a way to build out a, a design system in a modular way outside of the context when those components get framed together. So this is a, a way of kind of reducing the design and the development costs because you're clubbing together components and trying to reuse components uh, to the best of your ability there as well. And then good UX is iterative. And this is where the kind of the users uh, come into play. And of course, the users were involved at, at the start as well. So we used a tool called Envision. So if you're not familiar with Envision, uh, it's a kind of a piece of uh, like online application where you can import designs that then get used as a clickable prototype. And uh, there's like a viewing ability to put comments and hotspots in there so they can click through as if it's a real tablet application. So this really, really helped us with our stakeholders or, or users in our cases. Uh, to visualize what they needed uh, as well um, because they were able to really interact with it uh, with the aspects of the prototype and then finally the iterations on design you can see here this is the log of of changes that we were doing so based on the feedback from uh, a group of individuals now in an ideal world our group of individuals were would be much more diverse and much more kind of across the board but we just had some kind of uh, individuals that were representing reps so there was a, a kind of a focus group of sort that we were able to contact and they would be experts and knew kind of what was going to be needed in the field as well so they would be across kind of the states uh, and also europe as well so once you've kind of gone through your iterations an ideal situation is also to continue to build uh, to measure and to learn to drive enhancements on those dashboards so just three applications here that are really useful so first one is hotjar Hotjar is more so towards web space, like websites, a little code, a little bit of snippet of a JavaScript snippet, and that allows you to create heat maps from pages. It also allows you to record users' interactions. Second one is Airtable. This is where if you're interviewing your users, you can put in your insights. It's kind of like Google Sheets on steroids, kind of runs like a, a database of sorts. So you'd be collecting um, user feedback or insights or observations in something like Airtable. And then finally, Maze. Maze is a, an un, kind of unmoderated task oriented test. So you could give them a task uh, and, and send it to them to run through your Envision prototype. So then you're not having to be with the user to, to overlook them using it so they can be in their own environment a little bit more 
um, to kind of test the prototype that you have. So then my final um, kind of principle here is good UX is inclusive. And I think this is where we have the ideal world and the reality of the constraints of this particular case study. And I think it is very much on the user testing. So in an ideal situation, we'd have a much more diverse group of users to test with. And we've just got some parameters here or some items that we'd want to kind of tick off to get that proper diverse feedback. Um, and I think in our case, we didn't have as much as we wanted due to availability, which is something that is quite difficult to work around. And I think this is definitely a nice to have um, from sometimes some projects don't allow it because it, people see it as a, as a cost of time, being able to get the variety of users in the different locations. Uh, but I definitely think it's something that we want to definitely be striving towards. And then finally, uh, a tool that's really helpful for user interviews um, is Otter. So Otter is an ability to record a conversation and it'll all map out in text what that conversation is about. Again, it's a kind of a note-taking application for when you're doing the interviews, you're able to collect those notes. And then accessibility. So accessibility is something important that again can be built into a tool like Storybook. Um, and that's a way to add parameters that's going to help with accessibility. And these are baked into the components. Again, they're taken care of at a small level and then can carry on as and when your agencies start using these components in different applications as well. So just to, to finish off really, two uh, kind of closing stats, as it were. So 70% of uh, CEO, CUX, and customer experience, CX, as a competitive differentiator. And then racially and ethnically diverse companies outperform industry norms by 35%. So to just really wrap up, good UX is motivational. It reduces stress. It's consistent. It's iterative. And it's inclusive. Thanks for listening. Right, that stuck out for the last few minutes of that, so <laughs> forgive me if I repeat anything, but I wanted just to um, give you a bit more of our side on that project and what was interesting. So what was very different about this project, so it was a company called Alnine Pharmaceuticals, um, and they set out with two objectives, which is to help the reps know what the next best action was to do, which a lot of people are becoming very familiar with. It's some terminology in our industry that's becoming more and more common. But the other thing they wanted to do is the, the platform they used was Beaver, and it was seen as a chore by the reps, forgive me Chris, but it was really seen as just something they had to use to report a call. It was a transactional system they had to use. And they wanted to turn it from that, not for a business reporting tool, but for a selling effectiveness tool. So what they did, they took a huge project that was outside of what we were doing to bring in data on so the data that Dan showed you on there, um, and you saw the little red dots against the doctor's name, right? and that's called an alert, which is a various signal that come in as data. So they took data from, in America, something called Haystacks, which is a paid for identification for buying signals. They brought in website visits, they brought in medical information requests, they brought in international Congress attendance, advisory board attendance, medical, what did I say, medical information request forms, I might have done hmm. staff forms, if someone from a head office had phoned someone, they reported it in a vinyl, an app made in vinyl. If they had sent them a central email, all of this data was collected into a data lake warehouse, we call it, and then it was injected into Viva. And in turn, that system then reported it to the reps. Now there's no AI, there's no sophisticated algorithms, there's some algorithms, but it's pretty simple. It was basically, the rep could look at that map and go, where should I go next? Where's the next best place in my territory I'm gonna get at the opportunity to sell? And as Dan said, they again pull up contextual data. The first reason to do it was assess whether or not I want to see this doctor. Is this alert and the other contextual data enough for me to see this doctor? Because our nylon have not very many reps and they have very, you know, their, their time is precious. They have a small target audience. So it's very important to what we call assess. If you did assess them, you had that focus list that you saw. So that's where you're going to spend your time and focus. And then this is from my repping background. We'd like to believe that reps spend the evening before preparing for every call, <laughs> reading up on their doctor, because we all do that sort of stuff, don't we? Like I prepared this <laughs> last night. Um, but instead, you're in the waiting room, you've got 30 seconds, and you need to get that information in. What Dan managed to do is take all that data we talked about and make it into something very simple in a way that we're all used to little red alerts on our phone to draw the attention. Then to put the contextual data in a way that allows the rep to go yes or no, 
And then more importantly, if I have said yes, that 30 seconds before I see the doctor, what information can I pull in? Now what I'm really excited about is where we're going next with this project. I shouldn't have said the company name. Uh, <laughs> but where, we, where we're going next is starting to put some intelligence behind that as well. And actually starting to great segue this into the next presentation. But really what we get, what we've got, or what Dan managed to help us pull together is a brilliant information uh, dashboard for the reps. But I would say that some of the information in there maybe needs some interpretation and some things. So I, I jumped in there. So we've got any questions before we move to receive any questions for Dan or for myself on that project or the UX sort of thing. I was just going to ask, so um, from a sort of measurement point of view, just from UX, how do you tend to measure improvements in mm. usability and user experience? Is something like uh, making sure they have they spend less time getting to the app that you want them to, or what sort for this project and other projects? measure improvement mm. Yep, good question. So um, I think it very much depends on exactly the context. The timing to get to somewhere doesn't help because we don't know what the distractions are. So a lot of the time it's the, the kind of the interviews of being able to see, okay, here's a task. Let's see how you can perform this task uh, as, a, as a baseline and then work from there rather than having timed metrics uh, to make improvements. A lot of the time it is just those interviews. In this case, uh, we didn't have that kind of volume of interviews, but that would be an ideal case where you'd be interviewing and testing it and seeing people interact to find where you can spot those changes because they might not be checking and waiting and reading for a long time. So where's the improvement there if it's a time thing? So yeah, you're trying to find the right metric. Did I send you any quotes from the reps who agree that? It's probably one of the things, right? Hmm. Okay, it's not, it's not a metric, it's just how well did this land? So there is a metric in here, and Chris will be pleased. I keep wondering Chris, because Chris is from Viva, by the way. Um, <laughs> is there's 25% uptake in the use of Viva by the field boards. So that, and I didn't finish what, I finished what I was saying, is that transactional approach to Viva is something I have to use, has already shifted and is accelerating into this is something I want to use, which is really key. And they're not using it from a DSA perspective, this is just from call reporting and expert action. But um, the, 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 the uptake by the reps, the, I should have said some quotes, they're really inspirational quotes about how this is helping them doing it. And what's, what's a real good sign for me is what else they want in there. Can we include this? What about this view? And that's another challenge is controlling mm. because there's only too much data you want to put in there. But it's, it's landed very well. Um, and, and the reps, uh, uh, it's an ongoing project, which is always nice. Um, there was another question I thought somewhere. I guess I did have one in February did a week. I did a source of production task and I did a course mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, yeah. yeah, so if I can get out the tech right. question. So, yeah. so they're using a company called RX Data out in the States. To, and it's coming from the Salesforce is behind the Viva CRM anyway. Um, so it's all in Salesforce. Uh, but we are gathering it from a code a code free app in the system called Vinyl. Uh, what are the data sources they've got? They're buying data in. Um, I'm not sure if they use Viva Open Data or not, um, but basically the, the, there's a lot of different APIs into Salesforce. And then when it comes to the My Insights, it's really easy for us then to query the fields and pull it through. And then we have some simple time dependent, like there's one tile that shows you uh, doctors I haven't seen in the last six months who've had a signal and things like that. So we've got some pretty simple algorithms in place to do that. But essentially, that, was that your question? We just, yeah. So it's all coming into Salesforce. And it's a massive effort that it, it makes the front end effort seem you know minor mm. but as you start to get into practice of that and i think the vinyl app i didn't know what it was until but that allows everyone in head office for any interaction that they have with a the customer they're putting it through that and that will drop into this and that's great for the rep because they're seeing the full touch points around their customer what's missing for me and george will say that it's not too commercially sensitive is what's missing in all of this is the and this is key is moving a customer along the adoption ladder and anyone's been to one of these events before know have gone about this but you know it's about enabling the rep to know what to do next with that customer to move them to the next segment to move them from naive to trialist to experiment to stakeholder whatever your particular segments are mm. and that's what's going to be really exciting is whether we can get the rep to start to use this dashboard to help them see within the customer where they, where they sit mm. so, uh, thank you very much for your presentation um, so this is a really good presentation. Um, I guess for me, we're very good in pharma doing one and done. You know, we put a lot of investment up front, we're going to spend a lot of money in, we're going to do all the wonderful 
So how do you um, continue to keep this moving forward so that it's always staying fresh and relevant to the business and the needs that people need to know about? Yeah, and actually it was part of the design brief it down, right? So can you go back to one of the images with the yeah. um, assess and prepare components page? So first of all, the map is 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 is, um, is, is a useful interface, in right? But we, we have to really govern about how many different. I don't know if you explained down, but the, the color represents target, the red represents an alert, <coughs> the symbol represents a hospital versus a specialist versus a primary care, and then uh, we have a, like a gold circle that indicates that they're on your focus list. We, so there's a lot of information going on there. We designed that to be flexible. But the most flexible thing here is this components piece. So from a design perspective, each of these components. We looked at all the data that was coming in and all potential future data and tried to design a set of components that could be reused. And, and also, because this is a, so we know, you people know I love my blades, right? Mm. This basically just scrolls to the side, like, so you can, so it, basically it's endless, which is one of the issues is how do we control what's most important, what's prioritized, and you can, you can link to it. So we have thought about what more data is coming. Um, we but have. How do you engage with the brand team, etc., to kind of make sure that it's kept alive and it's reviewed consistently to say, yes, this is okay. still relevant next step? Yeah, so, so th there's, we're, in, we're in sprint three now, and we're looking at bringing in um, new data. They've got new products coming in. So, there's one of the challenges is just product um, uh, agnostic. So, how do we suddenly handle when we've got a target for one product and another? So, there's a new challenge that came in because we were never told that it was going to be balanced. There's always challenges. There's also, you know, how does AI in the long run come into this? So, as the data lake grows, you know, at the moment we're relying almost entirely on the rep making the decisions based upon the data presented. So, is there a way to start to digest that data and make recommendations, etc., on top of it? But in terms of the mechanism, the process of doing that, they're a very small team. And what was beautiful working on this project is our core teams, the core team calls we had every Thursday at one day, and we still do. Everyone on that call was there, ones that needed to make decisions. So there was field representation, the strategic director of digital, <laughs> everyone from Samir in the US. So as a, we were incredibly uh, agile, but not in the truest agile sense, because everyone was there to make decisions. And they're really well connected to the 50 odd reps they've got from the brand team. So there's a constant flow. I think it, I'd be interested in, in anyone else, like Chris and Eddie, work like this. Whether there's a more structured process for large companies where you do the gathering of input from brand teams and field, or anyone else with any kind of work. Often brand teams have rep focus groups that mm -hmm. they meet regularly. Yeah. That's, that's one mechanism that they can do back in. Yeah, the thing we found is that if you get your users involved in the UX process, so they're buying in from it really early, then you tend to develop super users. So yeah. you tend to take a, a rep who may have some interest in it, but doesn't really know how it's all going to work. You take their ideas, you help them take through the process, and they come out of it just singing about it and going telling them about it. So you can use this kind of small super users. Yes. So why aren't you making that process in Fever anyway? So this is it, they're like three text box saying those suggestions for improvements and then doing that analysis and that's good point. Because you know, you're talking about these Well, you can use Viva surveys, right? But that's against the customer account, so I don't know how that works. But um, yeah. Um, so so what, one of the things we're looking at um, based upon that, at the moment you can't adapt this per user. So basically, the order we think is most important to them is the order they get. Mm. Um, at the moment, it's not. we don't have the ability within my insights to save between sessions unless it got really complex piece time so we couldn't figure it out but actually allow the user to start prioritizing itself and that's always a debate between what a user thinks is important and what you know maybe is important and that's what there's a balance we found that we have to override a few suggestions um, yeah. so I'm not, i completely agree that this needs to be used for sales guys that's brilliant but then how do you also then have like a national picture of the brand team yeah. at their level so that you get the kind of like we we'll make decisions overall about the business and what we need to do. And yeah. So they, so they have a BI. So all this data is also accessed through vinyl. I uh, think they use either ClickStream or uh, Click uh, Click View or another visualization for this because they got the web the lake. They can now just pull into that how, how they want. Mm -hmm. So they're also taking the data out of the and into the lake. So it, it's it's two way. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I just one of the things we're talking about is we're setting up a territory for the national manager, so they had all the things and then they'll see all the data. But then why would you, a lot of the time, why would you see want to see at national level adopted data? 
you want to see the negative. Yeah. You, know, you want to see where people are around uh, adoption. Where yeah, if adoption is in there. It's a good question. How do you choose between the super users and the customer stories? That's the challenge I see. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, you've got internal voices, which are saying, I'm going to do this to again, but, you know, you're trying to fulfill, you know, a customer journey, right? Yeah. How, how do you, do you mean customer journey as in the user's list or the user's customers from this? At the end, you're selling it to somebody who's buying Yeah, it, right? okay, yeah. So how, how do you choose between well, I'll find a super user for me and yeah. So me. I'm glad to say that we didn't have to make a lot of those decisions because the Al uh, Hosham Al Wasari, who's the strategic digital lead for Al Nilam, can be quite focused. And he actually, you know, it's like wrangling a herd of cats, right? At some mm. point, you've just got to say that's the route we're taking. And the difference here is they knew it's a small team and they're very well connected. I'm going to call Colin in here. Great. He's doing this <laughs> at a global <laughs> level and having to get feedback. So talk about your my insights and invitation which has gone down really well, but your challenge is at 140 country level, yep. right? So it's a whole, that whole balance between the, the customer story or the, the user story and the direction you want to take. That was an interesting journey for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really hard. It's just, you just have to give us much of it. I mean, we, we, we used uh, like Stacey, that we were talking about this, like this week, so... <clears throat> We, we, can, we try and engage with teams like selling experts, try and get to those, um, to the major notes. So, critically, the, the groups of sales people who are quite engaged with marketing, so they've got their own type of groups. Yeah. It works okay, it's quite hard work to get to them. So, actually, we just use Viva to go straight through Viva, just use a Viva survey through our Viva admins in the countries to get to the reps. And actually, we got the voice of about 500 reps from the mine sites that we launched a couple of months ago. So it's more depth than breadth of user experience, but we got some really nice understanding of what it's meant to reps in terms of the time it's saved that they have to have on the And on the, the like the detail aid front, leaky the leaky URA was leaky. There. The leak leaky uh, that works the field. Um, you know, uh, we we sort of sat down and talked about like what it was like to work in the field now and how you input to marketing and all the rest of it. And there is a difference between a rep that's always engaged with marketing and wants to get into head office and wants to drive down that mm. versus actually the real users, the majority users. And sometimes that those guys can be lost in favour of the guys that always want to be in head office, always want to be sharing, always want to impress versus what's it like really on a day to day basis like we talked about. Mm. And then the last point which actually came up Today or yesterday, was that there's an interest in balance, and people, I'm not sure if you can see it other countries, we get told to um, be careful about overly surveying and getting user research from reps because they're really busy and they don't want to be on the survey mm. too much. But reps are really interested in this stuff, they want to be a part of it. Yeah. I'm quite worked out what, the, what, that, what that means. I, I, I think the latter will win, mm. but you, you have some internal pressures of get off my reps, they need to go to sell stuff. Well, you need that feedback, right? yeah. you, you, you have to have yeah. that feedback. Right? <coughs> yeah. But I just wondered how you make that balance. Well, we didn't do it anywhere near enough in this. Well, yeah. absolutely, I don't know if you mentioned that. Yep. But it, it, I, I mean, our original proposal to, to Al Island was like a series of workshops and, and, and surveys, and, and they just went, yeah, get rid of all that. We just don't have time. And, you know, sometimes like, well, it's landed really well, but now the suggestions are coming in. But I think. It's a bit like you also mentioned about using the Envision app to kick start the bloody process. Mm -hmm. So before Dan designed up the Envision app, and he probably mentioned this, but I found it absolutely pivotal on this project, is trying to get and meet the requirements out for the customer is really tricky. What is he trying to show? What are you trying to get it out of their head? And it's just like, Dan, go away and do something. We need to do something. And as soon as that Envision app came out, and it is, this is almost exactly like the end product, right? And it was some iteration, but as soon as they got that vision, they could play with it. They're like, ah, no, I want this and this and this is what I saw. This is where the data is going to go. And it really got the flow going. And it would be something useful to have done with reps, but we just went straight from head off. Mm. <laughs> right, we need to move on. If there's uh, one more on time, any other questions before we go? A little time? No? Brilliant. Okay, down. Thanks. Thanks.